Hi, I'm Paula Radcliffe. Um, I'm doing the Athletics Weekly Ask the Athlete section for today. So I guess I'll just crack on with the, the questions that have come through so far. So the first question was, what was your reaction to Ailish McColgan breaking European and British 10K record at the Great Manchester Run yesterday? Um, so um, I think it was such an exciting race um, coming in to the race I'd watched Ailish run in the London 10K and miss it by a couple of seconds there. So I think everybody knew that it was within her capabilities and uh, the way that the race panned out, it went off extremely fast and Ailish ran very smartly from the beginning in terms of just sitting back off the, the front of the pace, but maintaining enough contact there to close down at the end. And I'm not sure if she believed that she could catch O'Beary, um, but she certainly believed after the race that she was capable of doing so. So I think in the closing stages, I kind of forgot about the time um, and really just focused on, on whether she could catch O'Beary because she was closing so quickly and essentially, I guess, just ran out of road there. And it was, what, about four or five seconds at the end. And um, I think she was shooting for both. Um, so she was very aware that she was so close to the time and knew immediately that she crossed the line. Um, but I think there was also a little bit of, um, not disappointment there, but a little bit of, oh, could I uh, have managed to, to catch Helena Berry if I just started chasing a little bit sooner? So a long answer to that, but no, it's it's nice to see, particularly athletes like Ailish that I've seen growing up that I know well, um, to see them getting the, the rewards for, for running well and for putting in all of that hard work and training. And there have been seasons where it hasn't all gone her own way and um, so it's nice to see her now getting the, the chance to really uh, capitalize on all of that hard work that she and Michael and the, Liz and the team around her have put in. So the next question is what is the one most significant piece of advice that you received as a young athlete I did too constantly and would unhesitatingly pass on to a young athlete today? Well well there's a lot of advice there I think the biggest one would be um, from my coach to to set goals, to pick goals, and to have dream goals and realistic goals, um, and to write them down in my training diary at the beginning of the year. Um, so kind of New Year's Day, I would write down the realistic goals and the dream goals for that year. And then some of them would end up rolling over for, forever in terms of dream goals. Some realistic ones would get ticked off fairly quickly. Uh, and when you achieve a, a dream goal, there's no better feeling than just really enjoying that moment and then building on it to, to create the next goal. So I think it's essentially just all about stretching ourselves. And I'm really glad that I got that advice uh, as a youngster to to aim high because there's no such thing uh, as failure when you're really aiming high because you in failing will still achieve things that you would never have achieved if you didn't set out to achieve those lofty goals so I think that was the really important advice that I was given as a youngster um what age did you start running and how was it initially well my answer to this is usually that I can't remember a time when I wasn't running. Uh, I was always running around. Um, I love the feeling that I got from, from running, from running quickly, particularly on the beach or, or through trees in the forest. I absolutely loved that as a kid. Um, there weren't that many different sports options available to me then growing up in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, so I guess the biggest thing that I was drawn to was athletics and I pestered and pestered my dad and he took me down to join the local athletics club which was Frodsham Harriers as soon as I was old enough so when I was nine I went down uh, and joined Frodsham Harriers and then when I was 11 I moved to Bedford and um, that was a great move for me because it put me in contact with my coaches Alex and Rosemary Stanton and a great team of girls around me so I, I made some excellent friends we had a very successful girls cross country um, team growing up to begin with and road relays and I think that helped because it wasn't individual success early it was shared team success and we kind of all motivated each other supported each other um, and that kept us having fun uh, and enjoying the sport and Alex's big rule was 10% a year and I want you to be good seniors not necessarily good juniors so it was always a long-term plan um, with everything tailored towards getting the best out of ourselves as we got older and moved into the senior ranks. Um, my favourite event on the track 
5,000 meters or 10,000 meters. Well, actually, my favorite event might have been the 1500 meters if I was better at it. Um, I love the 3000 meters as well. Um, and to pick between the five and the 10, I mean, I probably would go for the 10 um, because I had slightly more success over the, the 10,000 meters um, and I was better suited to it. I think certainly psychologically, the downside being that with the 10,000 meters, you can't race them as often as you can the 5000 meters. And, I loved racing on the track and it was one of the things that I found hard when I moved to the road in the marathon uh, that I wasn't able to race as often as I had been able to on the track. So I guess that's a long winded way of saying I like them all. Um, and had I been better at the ones where you could race a lot more often, I probably would have loved those too. But yeah, the 10,000 meters, because it was the event that I was stronger at, um, I won uh, European title at it. I had the European record um, on the track. And so that was important to, to me to get that from uh, Ingrid Christensen, who had been such a big idol of mine growing up and had really given me a lot of advice um, moving towards the marathon, but also uh, and a huge inspiration on the 10,000 meters. So to, to get that record on a rainy night in Munich um, was very special to me. So yeah, I would pick the 10,000. Uh, next question, which current female marathon runner would you most like to have raced and why? Um, well, I guess the easy answer to that is I would like to race Bridget Koskai um, in the shape that I was in when I ran 2.15 and that she was in when she she ran at the 2.14. Um, and just to see how good a race that could have been, but that's kind of pie in the sky. Realistically, it obviously can't happen. Um, but yeah, I would like to, to be able to do that. Uh, what was your toughest session in a build up to a marathon? Um, again, that's a good question because I think it was more tough weeks that, that came together. Um, but I, I used to do a kind of long fart leg session on the track with alternating 400, 300, 200, 100 um, and bits of marathon pace thrown in there as well. And that was a tough session, but it was also a huge confidence boosting session when it went well, moving in to the marathon. So it was something that I used there. The long run was also a, a key tough session for me um, and my long tempo, which would have been about around about 10 miles. Uh, next question. How do you think uh, Let's Send About Gide will do in her debut marathon in December? I think she has the potential to run extremely quickly uh, and certainly threaten Bridget Koskai's world record. I, I think how fast she has run over the half marathon and her speed up from the 10,000 meters and 5,000 meters, even 3,000 meters will really stand her in good stead. So, I mean, I could see her easily with the capabilities of taking I dare I say two or three minutes almost off um, Bridget Koskai's world record. So I think whether she'll do that in her first outing or whether she will get to know the marathon um, a bit more first um, remains to be seen. But I, I think she has the potential to really take that record into, into unknown territory. Um, what time do you think you might have run in the super shoes? <laughs> well, that's a good question and one that I would love to know, but sadly we'll never really get the answer to. And I guess I can broaden that a little bit and talk about um, what I think the shoes bring. And I, I do think that the shoes do a huge amount in terms of safeguarding the health of runners um, and enabling them to, to do a lot harder training, to race a lot harder and to recover much more quickly. So in terms of lessening the injury risk and allowing legs to just bounce back more quickly from hard training and from hard racing, I think that is the big advantage. I also think they have somewhat changed the landscape of um, marathon racing in terms of the part of the skill used to be holding it together, holding your body together and holding your form together over the last 10, 12 kilometers. So once you've gone through 30 kilometers in a marathon um, and from what I hear and from what I've experienced running in the shoes, the big difference is that you get to 30 kilometers and your legs aren't as dead and as 
unabashed as they used to be. Um, so it becomes easier to hold it together in the closing stages, easier to finish more strongly, um, perhaps easier to get away with mistakes that you used to you used to have to pay very de dearly for in the closing stages of a marathon if you went out too quickly in the first 10k 10 15 kilometers now you can kind of get away with that a little bit to a certain degree um more so i think because of the plate and the cushioning in the shoes so i think in terms of that and in terms of being able to also race more often at the marathon so to learn the distance um and race it more frequently because the recovery process is that much quicker and it, it's changed the landscape for sure I think uh, of marathon running we would never train back in my day which makes it sound really old but back in my day we would never have trained in the shoes for long runs that we would race in um, and now I think it's absolutely something that a lot of the athletes do because they are the shoes that enable them to to train very efficiently and also to recover well as I've spoken about for the next session. Um, so those are, I think, the big differences. And yeah, I would love there to be some kind of algorithm or something where we could put in all of your, your running economy, your stats and um, VO2 max and see what you could run in the shoes. Um, I don't think that I'll ever be able to know that. Um, I think I probably could have run a bit quicker. Um, but what, the one thing that I am very grateful for now is that the shoes help me to be able to still enjoy running on a daily basis um, because of the progression in shoe technology. So that's why overall I'm a big supporter of it, even though possibly it cost me a few records. Um, biggest regret as an athlete or more broadly? I try not to have regrets. I try to, obviously we all make mistakes. We have disasters, um, certainly um, career-wise in racing. Um, I've had a few disasters, but I try to deal with them, to deal with the emotions of that, to learn what I can from them and then to kind of get rid of it and not to, to carry that baggage and bitterness and regrets forward in life. Um, so I try, I guess, to look on the positive side of things, the optimistic side. I've always been more of a, a glass half full rather than a glass half empty kind of person. So I do live in the moment in terms of the emotions. I learn what I can from mistakes and things that I get wrong, um, but try not to waste too much time with the re regrets because we can't go back in time. I can't do anything about it. Once the mistake's made, it's done. The only thing you can do is learn from it and try not to repeat that mistake further down the line. So that would be my answer to that. I try not to have too many regrets. Um, how does your broadcast career and roles in organizing events compare to your career as an athlete? Um, some things are very similar uh, and some things are very different. So I think one thing that I love is that it is something that the more prepared you are, you can do a better job. It's also broadcasting is also still something like racing in terms of if you can tune into your instincts and go with those sometimes it serves you well sometimes it goes completely wrong um, but sometimes it, it can serve you well as well. So I like the kind of pressure um you have to react under pressure you have to make decisions quickly and go with those it's in the same way that i did do when i was racing um so i kind of like that adrenaline buzz that i can still get from the broadcasting side of it and if you can't be out there in the arena competing then i really do feel that broadcasting is kind of a privilege um and the next best place that you can be in terms of the best seat to watch that and to try and convey it as well as possible. Um, I certainly am not anywhere near as good in broadcasting as I was racing uh, and that's a work in progress, but I also like that element of it that it's um, it's a skill that you need to, to work hard on and it doesn't just come easily straight away. It's something that you have to work at and work together with a team in the same way that I worked with a team when I was racing and training. Um, it's, a, it's a nice team in the broadcasting setup as well. So we work together, we have a lot of fun, we support each other. I probably get more support than I give, um, but th that is a process that's, that's still um, coming along. So I think being able to be in touch with athletics and to try and do something about taking it to people's living rooms um, is an honor. Um, it is a great sport. It's a sport that I absolutely loved being a part of and I still love being a part of. So a spillover from that, from the broadcasting side of it, 
is trying to, I guess, encourage as many youngsters, as many kids, as many people of all ages just to to get involved in running, to get involved in, in athletics and to follow it and to become a fan of it and to become a fan of what it can bring to you as well in terms of so many things, uh, self-confidence, knowing more about your body, working together with a team um, and just getting more out of yourself in life in general. And then, so I think there are so many great things um, about running and about athletics and to have still a role in passing that on to other people and to still be able to enjoy those great things myself is something that I'm very, very grateful for. Um, who do you believe out of the current crop of excellent British female marathon runners will break the two hours 20 barrier? Well, I think there are probably several that have the potential i think the one that stands out at the moment perhaps isn't yet even racing over the marathon um but i absolutely believe that ailish with the half marathon um speed that she's shown with the 10k speed that she showed over the weekend um and the fact that she's certainly still growing and learning about racing on the road has the potential to to go under two minutes uh two, two hours 20 by quite a long way not two minutes of course that was um a bit of a freudian set there she might do two minutes over 800 but um i think she would be more focused on, on breaking 220 uh, over the marathon distance um and then taking with her um some of the other girls as, as well so i think that is um what's exciting is we have uh, a group of athletes um charlotte purdy ran fast jess piaseki came and ran quicker than her uh, and they're kind of keying off each other and inspiring each other they get on very well uh, and i know that one good performance then inspires another to work well and maybe by training together as well they can help each other to to break through that barrier 